Hello. Welcome to Football Journeys, a B5 consultancy podcast presented by me, Matt Hemsworth. And me, Fraser Franks. Football Journeys is a podcast that ignores the glitz and the glamour of the beautiful game in favour of the pain, the graft and the rejection. Uh, For my part, I've been a media lawyer for nearly 20 years now and I work with clubs and I work with players to help protect their reputation and their privacy but ultimately it's about protecting the well-being of the young men and women uh, that go through that journey through the game that we love. And for me, I've been through that journey. I was an academy player at Chelsea and Brentford before sitting on a career in the lower leagues with the likes of Luton Town, Stevenage and Newport County. Before my career ended at the age of 28, I went to a heart defect. B5 Consultancy is about combining that experience to help players young and old, um, to make good decisions off the pitch, uh, but also to be there to support players when life doesn't go according to plan. In this series, we're talking to Liverpool FC's class of 2013-14. Those lads that came through that famous academy at Kirby, but didn't quite make it through to realise their Anfield dream. This is Football Journeys. This is part two of the Pedro Kiravella podcast. If you haven't listened to the first episode, then we suggest you go back and do so. We continue where we left off, with Pedro returning from a recent loan in the Netherlands, back in at pre-season with Liverpool, and wondering where his future lies. You'd had a good year in the Netherlands. Um, you came back season 2018-19. I think I'm right in saying that the first thing that, that happened that summer is that it looked like you were going to leave Liverpool permanently and go to France, and I, sh- I should be clear, and I know you want to make this clear, that the club that was interested was not Nantes, uh, but another French club. Um, could tell us what what happened there and what went wrong there? Well, basically, that um, everything was almost, you know, Liverpool received uh, an offer from Rosenborg in, in Denmark uh, for, I don't, I don't know how much, two, three million. And Liverpool basically accepted it, but I said I didn't want to go. So in that time, I went back to the 23s, obviously, because Liverpool, you know, didn't have me in, on their plans for, for that season. And I just went there and um, I trained every day and stuff like this. And, and one day my agent called me and, and told me that there is a team in France very interested. Um, he he passed me the, the contract. Even I have it here on WhatsApp, the contract of, of that team. And everything was... It looked like it was uh, very close to, to be done. Obviously, Liverpool wanted um, the same quantity as Rosenborg offered in that time. And there was little details, just uh, um, the club in France, maybe they were offering a little bit less, but Liverpool wanted the same. So it was like this. But this was the 1st of August. So we, we had still you know, the whole month to, to, to negotiate with, with, the, with Liverpool. And the days were passing by and, and I had no news. Uh, I still had no news. I was training with the 23s. Um, one day I was going to travel to Brighton to, to play with the 23s, the first game of the season. And almost after training, my agent called me and said, Pedro, don't go to Brighton. It's almost done. Uh, we, we, we go. And um, that time, one, one guy for Liverpool, he calls me. He said, no, Pedro, you have to go. At this moment, you are a Liverpool con- you are a Liverpool player, and uh, if you have a contract here, we want you to play against Brighton, so you you go against Brighton. So it was this really fine mar- emergence of of uh, of being done or not. So okay, I go to Brighton. I think it was 15 days left still, and they pass. I don't know nothing, 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 and I think it was the 26th of August or something like that that my agent told me that for some reason. Nothing is going to happen. So, obviously, um, I get very angry with my agent. I uh, start like, you know, I, I keep training with the 23s. So it's not where I want it to be. And um, 27, I think, the day after that, my agent calls me again and say that this option was on again and it was very close. So, he told me that the president of this club was going to call me. Where he calls me, I speak with him. Uh, tomorrow, the coach is going to speak to you. It's almost done. Don't worry. We are very happy to, to have you here. Stuff like this. Uh, I say, okay, perfect. I wait I wait for the call of the coach. I wait for everything to be done. Stuff like this. So the, 30, the 30th of August, so two days left on the, on the transfer window, I was in a hotel in Liverpool because I knew I was leaving, so I didn't have the house rented and stuff like this. So nothing happened. You know, 12 p.m., nothing, 3 p.m., nothing. And 
I send a message to the president of the team, the, I don't know, the 30th, uh, 7 p.m., late in, in the night. And I get no response from, from it. And I think myself, oh, maybe it's because they are very, uh, you know, they are doing the last things. They have no time to be on the phone. And the 31st, I get a call from, from Liverpool in the morning and they told me that they don't know why, but the, the contract has fall down and, and that I have to stay with the 23s for, for, for the whole four months of, of the first part of the season. And I could not believe it. You know, I was three months or two months of pre-season in a hotel uh, waiting for that move that, that we were so close. And uh, now, 1st of September, I, I see myself again on the 23s after four years of training with the first team and with no house rented and, you know, everything was like a problem for me. Wow. And you never received a response to that message you sent to the president? Never. Um, never again. Your, your head was already in France. Um, you've, so you've handed in notice on the property that you're renting in, in Liverpool and now you're living in a hotel in Liverpool. I mean, that is just the ultimate of limbo. It's, and, and the transfer yeah. window was shut at that point. So you've now got to, um, in your head, come to terms where you currently are and then go back to your under-23s, which is exactly where you were when you were 18. At this stage, you're 21. I mean, how, how long did it take you to get over that? How long did it take me? I think it took me until my I called my parents and I said, please, I need you guys to come to Liverpool for a bit. I don't know how long, but I need um, someone with me because if not, I think I cannot do it. And they came to me. We rent a house and it felt like, um, you know, at least I have my family there with me for a few months. <coughs> so, yeah, after it was, my head was in January the whole time. I was training and I was playing with the 23s for January for, you know, someone to, to see me, someone to, to say, okay, I take him on loan. So it was like this. It was, it was hard. Um, I remember we played Hertha Berlin in that uh, it's a cup that you play with the 23s. And the coach from Erta Berlin, he come and told me, what are you doing here? You know, it's not, it's not your, your level anymore. I say, yeah, it's true, but if you want, you can take me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was hard. It was not easy. But um, the players we had at the, at the 23s at the time and, and the coach, uh, Neil Critchley, I think um, they saw I was uh, a little bit frustrated and I was suffering and, and they gave me that extra uh, freedom to to do whatever I felt in, in, in each moment. And I know Neil, was, Neil Critchley was really important for you. I think he was a, a real mentor for you and was good to you. Um, but around that, so, but I guess the only thing that you had on the horizon was the next transfer window, because as much as, you know, you had no problem with Liverpool, you got on well with Neil, um, you didn't mind playing for the under-23s, but you didn't feel as though it was your level anymore. So, so January begins, and there is a time in which you're told that there's interest from Palermo, who are in, were they Serie B or Serie A? Yes, they were top top of Serie B, but they, the option was uh, just a short-term contract of six months, but they were in that time 12 points clear of the second, so probably they were going to Serie A. So and you, fly, you fly to Italy to, to negotiate that? Yeah, because I have to say, in, in that time, Liverpool... They saw that I could not stay with the 23s and they just did everything for me to go somewhere. You know, somewhere that I like, obviously. Yeah, and this option... So that's obviously a really good move to go to Palermo. So you jump on a flight, you go to Italy, uh, expecting that deal to happen. Um, but it clearly, for anyone who's looked at your career, knows it, doesn't, it didn't happen. So what, what, what no, happened? No, no. I remember in the group chat of the 23s, I was in the plane to, to Milan because I had to do night in Milan to see what happened. <clears throat> and I say, okay, guys, finally, I'm, I'm gone. I signed for Palermo on loan. Um, it's Serie B, but, you know, I signed a contract that if we go up to Serie A, I stay. And um, I sleep in Palermo. I sleep in Milan, sorry, the 30th of, uh, of January. And I wake up the 31st and I go... 10 phone calls from my agent, uh, people from, from Italy that were in contact with my agent and they told me you cannot go to Palermo. I said, why? And they said because the club had been sold in, in that night and the new owners and coach and stuff like this, they don't count on you because they don't know anything about you because I was as press um, signing from the coach, you know, and, and the people there. 
So obviously the option from Palermo was was gone, and in the really last moment of the of the Mercato, this option from Segunda División Extremadura came through. So quick, I had to take a plane from Milan to Barcelona, from Barcelona a plane to Sevilla, and then my agent was waiting me there, and we took the car two hours quick because I didn't have time to sign before the the window you know shut down. So I went on the car, quick, sign, and I think it was 11.45, 11.50 p.m. that I got uh, signed with, uh, with Extremadura and I started the day after. Wow. So, and, and so they, they drive you from Seville Airport to Extremadura. You, uh, you sign at the training ground, 11.45 p.m. You wake up in the morning. You're a player at Extremadura. Fantastic. Um, when did you find out that although you signed for them, you weren't going to be able to play for them? So this was, I think, uh, Thursday, no Wednesday, and the first, the first game that I was that I could play was Saturday against uh, Sporting Gijón. And um, I trained Thursday normally. I trained Friday normal, and Saturday, um, the coach over there he he always gave the the squad on the match day at the stadium, especially in, in home games. So I go to the stadium, I go to the changing room and I see the shirts of, of everyone. I don't see my shirt, I don't see my number anywhere. And um, the coach gave the squad, obviously I was not there, but he took me after and he said, Pedro, it's been a problem with, with the papers. It's, I think it's normal because you came so late that maybe the, the transfer didn't come through. But from next week, we are, you are able to play. You, you know, you will be one of us. I say, okay, no problem. So after that, every week, I was training normal. Um, called my agent on Friday. Hello, can I play t- uh, this weekend? No, still nothing. Nothing come true. And like this until March. Two months like this of, of uh, just being in, in limbo. I didn't know if I could play the weekend or not. And where are you living at this point? In a hotel. Also, for three months. Is it close to your family or in Spain or not? No, basically Extremadura is here and Valencia is here in the other part. It was seven hours by car or eight hours by wow. car. And for flights, I had to do two flights. It was a nightmare. It was so far. So easier to get to Liverpool from Valencia than... Yeah. Nah. yeah. But it is something that, that again, a lot, of, a lot of football fans don't see the uncertainty with where you're living and you know, that you could be here one minute and somewhere else the next minute and you can never really settle unless you're, unless you're tied down to a, a club long term and you're playing regularly, you're never really settled. And for you living, I know you were living in a hotel before in Liverpool and had a bit of upheaval there and then you have the same thing here and you still can't even play. What's, what's going through your head at this point? And do you have, I know you had your family with you in, in various points in your career, but were you on your own in this hotel? Yeah, I, I was on my own. I had always the the hopes of, of you know, one day they call me and say, OK, you can play. I know my agents, uh, my dad, they, they contacted the the Spanish Federation. I knew the case went like to a, spe, a, spe, uh, to a type of uh, court to, to see if, if I could play or not play. And the club, my agents, my family, obviously, we did, we did everything for me to play, even, I don't know, the last 10 games of the season, you know. But um, I think it was 15th of March or something like that, with two or three months left on, on the season, that I got told, uh, Pedro, it's impossible. You cannot play because you, don't, you are not uh, right in, in, in La Liga. So you cannot play. And it was that point that I thought, well, wow, now, you know, next season I'm in the last, the last year of the contract in Liverpool. Who's going to award me after that, you know? Who, uh, you know, I've been... I played in Holland... I played well, I come back, I play with the 23s. Now I come here on loan, which is the opportunity I wanted after after Holland. And I cannot play for six months. And, uh, you know, it was, I think, the the hardest things of on, on my on my career. I didn't know, you know, if the, if the train has had passed already. I didn't know if I was going to be able to come back uh, to play after not having played for six, seven months. And it was it was very hard. Yeah, so it's a really crucial part of your development, a, a year of your development, and you'd missed basically the whole year. I mean, you say six or seven months, but it's the whole season, really, realistically, mm-hmm. isn't it? So you enter that last year of your, your contract. Um, are you 
going back to the first team environment in Melwood or are you over at Kirby? No, I'm, I'm from the first day I'm, I'm at Kirby. From, I think there was no plans for me to, to be around the first team. Um, I went to Kirby. Obviously, we were doing everything for me to go back on loan again because Extremadura, they really wanted me again. And um, we did everything. Extremadura wanted to pay a small fee for the loan or for the even transfer because I had only one year left on the contract. But Liverpool, they just wanted an amount of money or just, you know, finish my, my contract. So I think really I was not even close to be on, on the plans of, of, of Liverpool that season. And there's a new generation of young players coming through, you know, Curtis Jones, Rian Brewster, players like that. I mean, how does it feel being the older, one of the older players in, in that team and, and feeling as though your pathway to the first team is, is probably, you probably felt gone by then? Um, for, as I said, for me, I said many times, football is, is football everywhere. And all I want is to play football. So if I cannot play football alone because they don't want me to go alone, I would never say no to, to a 23s game or even a friendly. Uh, you can speak to everyone. I wanted to play every single match. And um, I was excited because I saw players coming through from the, from the 18s, from, you know, um, that I thought that they were going to be big things in the future, you know. So for me, I wanted to be the best role model as possible to, to try to help them get to the level, you know, Curtis is at at the moment. I think... Curtis um, is a player that you have to to know well in a way that, you know, he has such a big personality that sometimes can be a little bit, or, or it can seem a little bit, um, how do you say, a little bit, um, you know, ego, you know, a little bit with, with a big ego, you know. He can seem a bit cocky sometimes. I guess yeah, he can seem a bit cocky. But, cool, yeah. Yeah, he's so confident and he's, he, he looks and he knows that he's so good, especially at, at 23 level, that you have to manage him, you know, in a, well, in, a, in a way that he feels good around the team. And I think the relationship between me and Curtis on the pitch as well uh, and outside the pitch, I think it helped him to, to, to be a little bit more mature on the pitch, especially the first season I played with him two years ago. And, um, you know, he... He trusted me on the ball. I trusted him on the ball. And, and, and we speak a lot about football outside the pitch. And, uh, you know, I'm so happy to, to see him doing so well because uh, from, from day one, I thought he was different to, to all the players. It's so a great it was... credit to you that, that you've, got, you've got every excuse possible yeah. to go into training and just to, you, just to have the attitude, you know what, I don't care anymore. I'm not going to train properly. I'm going to turn yeah. up late. I'm going to not look after myself. You've almost got every excuse possible that you could rely on. But we always, me and Matt are trying to, you know, we speak to a lot of academy players and under 23 players, just about how important it is to be a good professional and to, you know, while you're there and you've got these facilities and you've got this, you know, you don't want to be in the under 23s. But if you give it everything and you are professional, it will work in your favour and people want to help you. And you might get a little injury. We spoke to Nat Phillips last week that was in the same position. He said there was a little injury and because he was working hard in training, he wasn't where he wanted to be. But through, through that good attitude and hard work, an opportunity arose at Millwood and he took it. And if he'd gone the other way and he didn't prepare right and he, his attitude wasn't right, he probably never would have got it. Or if he did get the opportunity, yeah. he wouldn't have been in a, a good position to take it. So... It's a credit to you. You've, you've, you know, you've not used an excuse and you've just got your head down and, and got on with it. Yeah, for me, um, one of the things I hate the most is training at 50, 60 percent. Not me, the, 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 the team training that day. Even if it's a rondo, I, I cannot see people training at 60 percent because that really gets the, the worst out of me, you know. So I want it to be the example that even if things don't go your way, if you love football, you have to, to train as you mean, you know, you have to train as you love football. So it was not a job, it was not a work, it's something we are lucky to do. And especially in such an environment like, like Liverpool, even if it's the 23s. And um, yeah, as I said, the, the young players coming through, I, I wanted to show them that, you know, never is going to be everything straight and everything perfect. There's going to be moments where 
you just have to keep the same and, and, and keep playing because, as I said, football is football everywhere. And you were re rewarded for that um, attitude, Pedro, because you, you ended up going back over to Melwood. And, and as, as we've said, and everyone knows, Jürgen likes to play young players in, in League Cup and FA Cup games. Um, he played you in, a, in an EFL Cup match against MK Dons. Um, when did you find out about that? And, um, and how did it feel to be sort of introduced back into the first team environment? Um, I think it was two or three days before that game that uh, the Gafa he took some players from the 23s to to train with the first team. Um, as I said, in that time I was maybe since the first day of preseason training with the with the 23s every day. Um, and you know, I think it it was a reward for me of of just being normal of of just not. Uh, overdoing things, just, you know, keeping it simple for everyone. And, and he he put me about 30 minutes of that game. And, you know, it felt good. But um, even if it felt good, it felt like I didn't deserve to, to, to pass everything that was happening to me, you know. Um, you know, because I was on the bench, but on the bench I had players that were 18, 19, or 17, like Harvey Elliott, you know, and, and I was 23 or uh, 22. And um, it was like, pff, honestly, I'm in the same level as, as some other guys that are just 17, 18, you know, so in my mind it was a little bit hard to, to see that. It, it, I think it's credit to you that you put it in that way. I mean, the idea of being 22 or 23 and able to play for Liverpool is a dream for, for everybody. It doesn't matter if it's an EFL Cup match or not. But I understand what you're saying. And I guess, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you felt as though you needed to go and find what your level was and play at that level week in, week out, rather than be a bit part of the same level of a 17-year-old Harvey Elliott or Curtis or, or the other boys. Um, and you only play, you played the last 20 minutes. Um, so but at least you were being brought back into the first team environment and you were progressing. Um, now, listeners might not know that things actually went quite badly wrong after that through no fault of your own. I mean, to tell us what then happened. So, finish the game, happy, get some texts from, from friends, from my family. And the day after, um, the day after or two days after, we go back to the 23s. I think me, Curtis, Harvey, Rian, the guys who were around the first team, and we were going to travel to Arsenal to play Arsenal away uh, for under-23 game. And I finished training, I get shower, I'm in the canteen having some food with the lads. And um, I receive a call from, from Chris. And he tells me to go and, to go and speak with him on, on, his, on his office. And I go and he tells me that I cannot play because the papers, my papers are not uh, written in, in the the FA or whatever. And you know, me and Chris, we always have a, a joke uh, relationship. You know, we, we, we mess a little bit with each other. We, we have a very good relationship of coach player, but also a little bit for all that happened to me, also friends, you know. So I didn't believe. And then I saw him that he, he got very, very serious about the situation. And he told me that, uh, you know, I cannot travel and I need to go home. And actually, all the games that I played for the 23s, and the game that I played for the first in the day before, I shouldn't have played. And it was it was a loss for, for Liverpool 23s. And in this case, in the cup, um, you know, the Liverpool was gonna go out of, of the cup. So I could not believe I, I took a taxi back home and I called the, the lawyers from Liverpool and I called my dad. And in this time, nothing came through social media yet. So I knew that was coming. And I neither want to come because I, I know what people are in social media. They have no, they, they just write what they think and, and they can do, you know, they can be bad, bad for me in, in that case. So the lawyer from Liverpool, he tells me, it's true, we, we, there's a mistake uh, from Extremadura or from La Liga or from DFA. But at the moment you cannot play and, and we are in big trouble, you know, because we can be out of the cup. And then I went to sleep. And the day after, I wake up and I have thousand Twitter messages, thousand Instagram messages, with friends calling me. Um, so my my girlfriend actually told me, "Don't go on Twitter." And 
you know, but even if you don't go on Twitter, you receive the messages. They tag you, they they write at Pedro, ta, 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 and, and you receive the messages. And, you know, I receive so much abuse and so much hate for 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 people and, and for something that it was not my fault that it was, I think, that with Extremadura, the, the lowest moment of, of my career. And, and I just wanted to disappear from England and disappear from, from Liverpool. I just didn't want to be around the team and the club anymore because I thought the, the last two years everything was against me. I don't know what what it was, but I could not be able to grow as a player or as a person in, in, in that city, you know, in that club. To happen once is uh, is unlucky, but for this to happen three times to you is madness. And uh, probably a lot of these... Uh, I don't I don't understand what the abuse from Liverpool fans could have been or how they could have thought it was your fault, but... You know, hopefully a lot of them that that listen to this podcast will understand how it made you feel and understand that there's a human on the end of these messages. And it was your chance to, you know, you were back in the fold. And then it seems like through no fault of your own, you've now taken two steps backwards and, you know, you can't be involved even in an under twenty uh, under 23 setup. Yeah, no, even even the the day the day that, you know, it was all over social media and it was over Sky and, um, and all, all like that. I didn't even want to go for a walk. Um, I remember it was my girlfriend and, and and the dad of my girlfriend in, in the in the flat we had a, a, in town, and my girlfriend just forced me to to go for a walk. And I remember going out with a hood with a snoot like this. I didn't want people to see me, you know. I didn't want people to to recognize me because I felt so so little, so small in that moment. And um, you know, people saying um, he's been here six years and and we paid two million for him. He does nothing for us, and now um, he cost us the elimination of the cup, and he cost us the two hundred thousand that we have to pay. And stuff like this, that I was thinking, well, what can I do? I can't do nothing about that, you know. One thing that's really remarkable. I mean, there's so many things that's remarkable in this story. One is is how you keep going and how professional you um, you are in that, and the club reward you again for that professionalism because the club weren't thrown out of the League Cup for that paperwork um, discrepancy. They went on to play Arsenal in the next round. And you played, you came on as a substitute uh, with about half an hour to go, plus half an hour of extra time. And that was the five-all draw game. So you played in one of the most remarkable games of that season. You then played in the next round, because Liverpool won on penalties. You then played in the next round with the quarterfinal. And if that was a strange year for Liverpool in the League Cup, I mean, this really summed it up. It was effectively Liverpool's under 23s. Neil Neil Critchley was the manager for that game because Liverpool were playing on the same or the next day in the World Club Cup. So Neil picked a team of under 23s, and you were what the most experienced player in that game against Aston Villa. Yeah. I remember watching that game and was very proud of the way that you all played uh, because you matched Villa the first 20 25 minutes. He then scored and, and and rolled you over. But I mean. Tell us about well, there's a lot to, to pour over in that, but tell us about those two those two games. So come through that bizarre experience with Milton Keynes. You've then got those two. Yeah, the, the Arsenal game was um yeah, it was a good memory because obviously when you play for Liverpool, it's always a good memory, but it came on the back of, of a very, very bad month of uh, a month where I was just uh, you, you you can ask everyone, Critch uh, was telling me Pedro, you are not you. You are always. You look angry. I, I'm never angry. I, you know, in training, I every little thing. I was, I was uh, angry. So the Arsenal game was a little bit still, not not a very good memory. It was a good memory because I played for Liverpool, but on the back on everything that happened, I was that was still on my head, you know, because I think the Arsenal game was the first game that I could play after all this, all the all this happened, you know. And 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 you come on. And I felt the pressure of uh, don't do bad because, you know, you, you've been in, in Twitter the whole month, everyone talking about you now. If you come on and you do something strange or you, you do something bad, that, that then they kill you, you know. So I didn't enjoy a lot that, that moment. Did After you take the, a penalty, Pedro? No, no, no. No, no, I could not. I could not. <laughs> that would have been real pressure. <laughs> I could not. I, I didn't have the, the guts to, to take it after after all that happened, to be honest. And then the Aston Villa game was a nice experience because it was just taking the 23s that we used to play every week 
to to a Premier League stadium against a Premier League team. Um, we we didn't have, and it's true, we didn't have Curtis Jones and Rian Brewster. We didn't have someone else, I think. So, you know, there was some big names missing on, on the pitch. But I think we we prepared the game very well. We were all very excited about it. Um, me, obviously, I had to to control the emotions of, of a lot of players that, you know, were making their debuts for, for first team. But it's something I feel comfortable with. I, I like to to speak, to help uh, young players. And um, I think the first 20 minutes, we have two or three chances that, you know, you never you never know if you score one of them, what's going to happen. But obviously, we knew that whenever we concede one goal, it was going to be difficult, you know. But I think after that, you know, we were proud of, of how we perform. Uh, we received uh, calls from the GAFA and, and, you know, Pep uh, in this case, and, and they were very happy. And something that they don't know as well, they had no plans on me uh, going going to Qatar the day after. Go and to, after the game, going to, to the World Cup. There was right. Harvey Elliott, Harvey Elliott, Sepp and Kijana, I think, that were traveling to, to Qatar straight after the game to join the, the first team. And, um, you know, I had a good game. And they after the game, Pep uh, called me and he told me if I had my passport with, with me. And I say, no, I don't have my passport. And he said, okay, let me just do something. Let me speak with, with someone and with Ray in this case, I think. And um, they wanted me to go to Qatar as well with, with the team because of the, I don't know, the performance or, or whatever. And um, at the end, I couldn't go because they could write me in 24 hours before the first game. But it was already, you know, it was 12 hours or something like this before the first team played. Uh, the semi-final of, of the cup, but then I didn't go. But it was nice, you know, for them to to call me and and be part of the team that won the the World Cup of of clubs. The situation was a bit different, but it's paperwork defeated you again. Yeah, yeah, but it, you know, it, it was it was different, but also, you know, <laughs> in my mind, I had everything booked for going to Spain, you know, for holidays for Christmas <laughs> break. So now I was thinking, okay, it's great, but you know. I also wanted to to be with my family after all all that happened. So it was win or win for me. It was win because I was going to be with the team in the World Cup and win because if not, I was going to go to Spain with my family. And uh, have a Feliz Navidad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then the real redemption came with the FA Cup in January. Um, when you talk about it wasn't it wasn't quite as young an under 23s team, but it was a, a pretty young team. Liverpool played in a Merseyside derby in the FA Cup, a game that was lit up by Curtis Jones, got a great goal. And you were like one of the senior players in that team. I presume that must have been one of your proudest moments for, at Liverpool. I think that's the best moment I have in Liverpool. For me, for my family, um, professional and personal. Because it was, uh, you know, against Aston Villa, we had no pressure, you know. If we didn't perform, there was it was right to not perform. You know what I mean? It was just the 23 game that we put together to play a game but um, against um, Everton we had to win it's it's a derby it's after Christmas um, we, we had to win it's in Anfield and, and for me I was so ready for that game and, and I you know after all the experiences I had my mind was so focused on that game and, and on performing well that I really prepared myself um, for the best I, I only thought about me having a great game and I think with the team we had, you know, we could win Everton. And that was the, the feeling before the game. Um, we knew that they were gonna, that they were going to go probably the strongest 11. But we knew with the team we had on the pitch, we, we could have, we, we could win Everton. So that was the, the feeling. And after the game was, was an amazing feeling for me and, and my family. Um, you then went on to play a few, a couple more games again. <clears throat> in Shrewsbury in the FA Cup and, and, and that was the end of your time at Liverpool. But um, what's amazing to say is that I've, I know from speaking to you before, during that season, you had done so well, your attitude had been so sublime that the club actually offered you a new contract, which you turned down. I mean, how long did you have to think about whether or not you'd accept that? Mm, to be honest, not much. Um, because, yeah, it was a long-term contract. Uh, it was a contract where the idea was to go on loan for the first couple of years because I think 
everyone thought that that you know after after uh, about two years everyone thought that by playing I don't know 60 games in two years I could become the player they thought to be part of the of the of Liverpool but then I thought to myself that I don't want to go on loan again and move again and then had to come back to Liverpool it was it's you know it's it's not easy you you had to find a house one day uh, in one country then come back to Liverpool find another house there move all your stuff you don't know if you go on loan again or not so for me it was no for me I played six games six good games this season for me it's time to move and we decided not not to not to sign the contract do you feel you're at a stage of your life, you're 23 now, and are you still with your girlfriend that you mentioned? And so did you feel as though you're at a time of life where you want to settle a bit and be yeah, in a exactly. place? And, um, and, and Nantes was agreed quite early on, wasn't it? I mean, I think you knew you were going to Nantes um, relatively early. Uh, yeah, it was... I started knowing about them in, in April, I think, something like this. Yeah. April, May, uh, start of May, April. Yeah, April. And so you were ready to go for the the season, yeah. on, notwithstanding yeah. COVID. But uh, I was I was very clear with with Liverpool and everything. I I I have I still have a good relationship with the Gaffer, and he he actually was the one that knew the first of of my words because I called him when I was in in quarantine in, in Liverpool. Um, I called him to just to speak with him and to let him know my options in my head or staying or going back to Spain to a club that I had or coming here. And he was the one actually who kind of structured my head in a way to, to make my decision better and clear. So he, very mature, sorry, it's a very mature for a 23 year old to make that decision when Liverpool during that quarantine period, uh, you know, 99% they're going to win the league at the end of the season. And to be, you know, to, to almost turn down a, a contract offer from the Premier League winners and Champions League winners. But to, to do it because you're seeing the long-term vision of your career and you're thinking, right, I'm 23 years old. Do I want to be a squad player at the best club in the world or do I want to go and create a proper career for myself? And it is, it's, it must have been not an easy decision for you, but, but it's, a, it's a mature one and one that you, where you're putting your football career first. A, a lot of people tell me uh, or ask me why I didn't stay because... Not even for this season. They they asked me why I didn't stay for the celebration of the of the league title and why I didn't stay for things like that. And for me, even if I was training with the with the first team for last season, it was from like October, November till till the, the COVID. For me, I, I didn't feel part of the of the champions, you know. Me, I knew I had my space in training of the first team. I knew in the cup, I was going to be there and I was going to perform well because I was training with the best players in the world. And I was being trained by, by a great coach and a, and a great technical staff. So I, I was ready. But I knew with three months left on my contract, I was not going to play because, you know what I mean, uh, it, it would be a, a gift for me to play. Because maybe imagine if I play five games, I do well, and then I go to a big club and I, you know what I mean? So... For me, it was like, oh, I'm, I'm happy to, to have been at Liverpool at that time with the best players and the best coach in the world and everything. But I'm not a Premier League winner. You know what I mean? And that was on my head. I didn't want to be part of something that I didn't deserve, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. And so talk to us about Nantes. It's another country. It's another language. When I signed for Nantes, I was already, I was already in Spain after, the, after I left Liverpool. And uh, we... We got in contact with a French teacher and she was coming to our house to, you know, to, to make some lessons with me, my girlfriend, my brother and, and, my, and my dad. So it took us like three weeks for three times a week. So it was quite intense, but, you know, I wanted to have the base of, uh, of friends for when I come here to, to not be completely lost. Um, and after I come here, there was, there is two Brazilians in the, in the changing room that can speak uh, Spanish or Portuñol, which is, you know, the mix of Brazilian and of Portuguese and, and Espanol. So it was not, it was not very, very difficult. Um, what it was difficult is the, you know, pre-season we, we had, because the French league stopped in March. So they had 
11 weeks of preseason, which for someone who plays football, it's too much. Um, and me, I didn't have big holiday because I was in Liverpool. And, you know, we were doing all the running that we have to do and stuff like this. And after I went almost direct to, to none. So it was long. And we couldn't play a lot of games because of the COVID. We, we had a lot of cases in our team. And it was very strange, the, the start of the, of the season. Um, it's, it, it's been a tough season because of that. At the moment we're talking to you, you've had a really rough run over Christmas. And you, the manager that's just come in, another new manager at Nantes, will be a name that will be familiar to English listeners. Um, Raymond Domenech is the new manager. Um, I won't ask you for opinions on your new gaffer because I've, he's, he's only just started. Um but um, how does the French league compare to, well, you've got a lot to compare it to, um, Dutch football, English football and, and, and Spanish football? Um, I think it's very, very physical. I think I actually spoke with one guy from the media the other day and, and he asked me this question and I said that the English and the French are very physical, but I think the English teams are better work tactically in a way that they respect each other a little bit more whether here in France is more like just we go we go you know there is no space to think and, 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 and try to win the game by a tactical way whether in England even though if it's very physical there is also teams very well organized and very well worked and um, I think that's the biggest difference between France and England and obviously Spain is I think it's the other way around. It's maybe less physical, but more tactic. And, and there is more space in, in, in the midfield to play because there is no as much pressure as in the other leagues. I would ask you what the uh, difference in playing in, in England and France is in relation to the way that the crowds respond. But that's something we'll have to uh, keep for about a year's time to talk to you about that. Um, but Pedro... Your journey is absolutely fascinating, and we're so grateful for you spending your time with us. It's amazing. Through. There's so many, there's so many things that you just like from doing Google in your name that you just have no idea about, and like yeah, some of the that. some of the ups and downs are they're quite dramatic, and a lot of not a lot of players would have experienced what you've experienced. But yeah, loads of ups and downs, loads of changes. Um, I think something that doesn't go that goes a little bit unnoticed is that whole moving process because I'm I'm someone that's moved club a little bit and I've moved six times in the last seven years yeah. and people don't especially when you're on short contracts or loans people don't people underestimate how how much of a, a struggle that can be is like moving to that city moving in that hotel yeah. living you know where your family live all this kind of stuff and you've gone through a hell of a lot of experiences for, for a 23 year old yeah so me, me. Oh, I, I was I was in Spain I was in Spain I already had time for not for Nantes and even without looking the house, I agree to move into that house because I didn't want yeah. I didn't want to be in a hotel anymore. You know, but you have no idea about the area. You have no idea about. No, no. I just I, I, I like the house. I like yeah. the house, and I thought to myself, I'm not gonna be one month in a hotel again. Mm. So I came here. I was two days in a hotel, and then I moved to the house straight. <laughs> Brilliant. Fraser and I really wanted to come over and uh, exploit your hospitality and go and watch you play in none. And maybe we'll get the chance in the future. But um, thank you so much for uh, spending this time. Thank you, guys, because I think um, there is some very interesting histories in, in, in all academies, especially, you know, in a big academy like Liverpool. So it's very good for everyone to to listen and, and, and to hear that it's not always easy and it was you know it's not only... Uh, good things that happen to, to young players. So thank you. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you, Pedro. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Football Journeys um, and thank you to all those who supported us. Do come and find us on social media at Journeys Pod on both Twitter and Instagram where we'll be sharing more content. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us on footballjourneys at b5consultancy.com or visit our webpage b5consultancy.com slash footballjourneys please do like and subscribe. If you feel we deserve a five-star rating, then please give us one. The more successful this podcast is, the better chance we have of producing more, more episodes and further series.